Now the dummy variable is a very useful tool in econometrics and economists in their empirical research find it very useful. Uh, we are going to discuss in this section, we are going to discuss a few of the uses of dummy variables uh, other than uh, just the regular regression, running of the regression in form of ANOVA or ANCOVA. Okay. The first use I am going to discuss with you is you can use the dummy variables as an alternative to the Chow test. Now to understand this part that I am going to discuss, you first need to um, just have a relook at uh, what the Chow test was. I discussed it under the different types of hypothesis testing that you come across when you are uh, dealing with a multivariable regression model. So for those who uh, do not remember that, pause this video, please go back and have a look at what the Chow test was, right? It has been uploaded onto your Moodle um, site. So um, in short, the Chow test helps us to test for the structural stability of a function. We had used an example uh, in the earlier classes where we were testing the relationship between savings and income okay and uh, we were doing it on a macroeconomic level so savings was the total savings in the country every financial year and how it is being affected by the total GDP of the country right so the example that I had discussed with you uh, was um, related to India's savings function where we had data from I think 1975 to 1996-97. Now structural stability means that when we are estimating the savings function we have a, if we have a feeling that the nature of the function or the shape of the savings function is changing during any one of the periods then we would say that the function the regression function is not structurally stable in the example we had discussed earlier in the case of india we suspected that the relationship between savings and income had experienced a change around the period of 1990-91 which is when India was forced into the liberalization, privatization, globalization regime. And in the Chow test, we um, ran three separate regressions. The first regression was a pool regression where all the observations were taken from 1975 to 96-97. And we ran a single regression function with savings as the y variable and uh, per capita GDP or GNP as the x variable. So this is called the restricted model because we have imposed a restriction on it which says that the relationship between savings and income is constant throughout the 20 year, year period from 1975 to 1995-96. Now this need not be true. We do suspect that around 1990-91 there is a structural break which means the savings function or the nature of relationship between savings and income prior to 1991 is different and hence represented by a different line or function uh, as compared to the regression function that represents the relation between savings and income post 1991 right so in the chow test we next ran two separate regressions for the two separate sub periods and we constructed an f statistic based on the r square values of the restricted and the unrestricted models.
I'm not discussing the formula for the F statistic. You can always have a look at the uh, earlier video lecture that had been uploaded. So in the Chow test, we run the regression three times. The restricted version where we have the same function for the entire 20 year period and two separate regressions for the two separate sample periods, right? Sub periods. Now, rather than run three separate regressions, the dummy variable alternative allows us to test whether the function between y and x have been stable throughout the period or not by just running a single regression. That regression will look something like Okay, uh, it will look something like this. Okay, but before we do that, uh, let me just mention another advantage of the dummy variable. Um, in the Chow test, while the F statistic does tell us whether the, par the function is structurally stable or um, not based on the critical value of the F, distribution it does not tell us the source of the difference that is it that is we can successfully conclude that the savings and investment relationship was different prior to liberalization and after liberalization but how is it different is it is the difference in the intercept terms or is it the difference in the slope coefficients or is it both and this knowledge can be very useful to us when we are um, estimating such functions to make predictions and other estimations so we talk of four possibilities the first possibility is where the intercept and the slope coefficient remain the same that is the both the regression functions are same or coincident regressions and if this is the case that means prior liberalization and post liberalization the entire 20 year period from 1975 to 95-96 we have the same functional relationship between savings and income. Another possibility is that only the intercepts of the two regressions change but the slope that is um, change in savings due to unit change in per capita GNP remains the same. Now if this is the case we will have what is called parallel regression. The diagram for parallel regression will look like this the B diagram. As you can see it is only the intercept that has changed since the slope remains the same they will be represented by two parallel lines where one line will represent prior to liberalization before 1991 and the other line would represent the savings income function post liberalization or after 1990-91. It is possible that the intercept of the two regressions remain the same. However, the slopes are different. In such a case, we call it concurrent regression. This is figure C. So I'm talking about this figure. As you can see, the intercept remains the same. So one, but the slope has changed. So prior to liberalization, you can probably expect um, change in savings due to unit change in per capita GNP to be say um, lambda two. Whereas post liberalization, that is after 1990-91, the change in savings due to change in a unit of per capita GNP is represented by gamma 2, right? So this is called concurrent regression because they start from the same point. The fourth and the final possibility is that there is a change in the intercept as well as the slope of the functions, which means two different, totally different line segments have to be used to describe the relationship between savings and income prior to liberalization and post liberalization 
in technical terms we call it dissimilar regressions right so like i was saying the chow test does not tell us the source of the difference it can only tell you whether there is a difference in the regression function pre and post liberalization but it cannot tell you what sort of difference is there is it a difference in the intercept terms or in the slope terms or in both and the dummy variable technique allows us to discover this difference or um, understand the source of the difference by running just a single regression how do we do that so this is what the single regression equation looks like here alpha 1 plus alpha 2 dt is the dummy that we have introduced here the dummy is equal to dt is equal to 1 for all observations um, between 1974-75 to 1988-89 uh, please note that the correct years are mentioned over here I have copied this as an image from the soft copy which is why um, it is different uh, in the edition that you have with you the soft copy edition it is an American edition which is why all the examples are also based on um, empirical tests done uh, with US as the main subject okay uh, the Indian edition which can be purchased um, has an example related to the savings function observed in India so dt is equal to 1 if it is pre liberalization sorry uh, post liberalization that is after 1989-90 and it is equal to 0 if it's a pre liberalization period okay beta 1 x times xt where xt is your per capita gnp or income and you also have another beta 2 dt xt okay so we have a combination of the dummy as well as the covariate coming over here when we take the expectation of these functions you will understand why we have taken this form okay plus ui is ut is the usual standard error term now we assume that e of ui is equal to zero that is most of our ols assumptions are satisfied and if that is the case as you can see the mean savings function for the period 1974-75 to 1988-89 that is pre-liberalization period so in the pre-liberalization period as you know the dummy was defined as zero so this alpha 2 times zero this term will disappear also this term will also disappear as dt becomes zero and anything into zero is equal to zero so during the pre-liberalization period the mean savings function or the mean savings will be expectation of yt given dt equal to 0 and xt in that case since this term and this term have become 0 we are left with alpha 1 plus beta 1 xt as the average savings function now when the period is post liberalization your dummy variable dt is equal to 1 which means your mean savings function that is expectation of yt given dt equals to 1 and given the value of xt is equal to alpha 1 plus alpha 2 into 1 so alpha 2 is there as a part of this plus beta 1 plus beta 2 xt so in this equation over here alpha 2 which is the coefficient of the dummy variable is the differential intercept term 
and beta 2 will be the differential slope term. The reason we are calling it differential intercept is because when the dummy variable takes the value of 1, alpha 2 will give you by how much the intercept has changed from the pre-liberalization period. In the pre-liberalization period, the alpha 1 represents the intercept. So, when you enter the post-liberalization period, dt is equal to 1. And by how much has the intercept changed? By plus alpha 2. Similarly, um, pre-liberalization period, the slope was beta 1. And post-liberalization period, the slope changes by a value of plus beta 2. So, beta 2 is known as the differential slope coefficient right now how does this help us decide whether we have different um, regression functions pre and post liberalization period all you have to do is check the significance of alpha 2 and test the significance of beta 2 if you find that alpha 2 and its related t value is statistically significant that means the intercept does change in the post liberalization period similarly if you find that beta 2 or the differential slope coefficient is statistically significant you can always conclude that the slope coefficient of the regression function the slope of the row uh, regression function between savings and income is different in the post liberalization period so not only are we able to determine whether we need two different regression functions for the pre and post liberalization period we are also able to accurately point out the source of the difference is it a difference of the intercept is it a difference of the slope or is it a difference of both? Um, remember, the introduction of the dummy variable in the additive form helps us to distinguish between the intercepts of the two period uh, because it is alpha 1 plus alpha 2 d2. dt not d2 right and uh, here the dummy variable has been multiplied with xt so it is called an interactive or multiplicative form and introducing the dummy variable in this interactive or multiplicative form enables us to differentiate between the slope coefficients of the two periods I will just end this section with a discussion of the advantages of the dummy variable over the Chow test of structural stability. Um, first, um, we need to run only a single regression and no need to run three separate regressions as in the Chow test where we had one restricted version and two unrestricted versions. Um, one of the main advantages of this we will discuss in the fourth point. So this single regression can be used to test a variety of hypotheses like i mentioned earlier it can tell us or it can help us uh, test the hypothesis that the regressions are concurrent they are parallel or they are dissimilar right as i mentioned the stability of the entire regression can be tested simultaneously by using the f test as in the regular regression models and if the hypothesis that alpha 2 equals to beta 2 equal to 0 is not rejected that means the regression lines will be coincident regressions which means the same relationship between savings and per capita GNP continues pre-liberalization as well as post-liberalization. Um, third one is that we do not know which one of the four possibilities um, is the reason for the difference 
when we are using the chow test on the other hand the dummy variable technique it tells us exactly what the difference between the two functions are pre and post liberalization and this is my main one which i have not discussed yet since we are running only one regression which is using all the observations given in the sample we are able to um use or have an increase in the degrees of freedom the greater the degrees of freedom the larger is your sample and therefore the more precise the estimated parameters okay the closer they will be to the true population parameters uh, remember in the chow test when we were discussing we had data for 20 years from 1975 to 1995 96 that's around approximately 20 years and when we are splitting it into the two sub periods you are left with say um, something like 12 years prior to liberalization and 8 years post liberalization so you are inevitably forced to deal with small samples and most of these ols assumptions if they are violated they become very critical if you are in handling a small sample in a large sample even if these some of these assumptions are violated you can still manage to um derive reliable estimates and reliable hypothesis testing conclusions okay so since we are pooling all the observations together we have a greater number of degrees of freedom of course you should keep in mind that every time you add a dummy variable and because of a dummy variable you are every time you are estimating an additional coefficient you are losing one degree of freedom each but overall since we are pooling all the variables together all the um observations together we do end up with a larger number of degrees of freedom than in the case of a chow test that's it for this section thank you